Welcome to Archaeology 101. In today's topic, we are going back to the Pliocene period of East Africa four million years ago, where we're going to meet the oldest known Australopithecine, Australopithecus anamensis. Before we jump straight into anamensis, I should provide some context on Australopithecines as a whole, so you have some of that background knowledge on this genus. So what is an Australopithecine? They're a group of early African hominins. They appear in Africa around 4.2 million years ago, which is during the early Pliocene. They're all bipedal, and they're likely the ancestors of Homo, uh, including us, and they broadly are split into gracile and robust australopithecines, and in our next slide I'll demonstrate what that means. The two images on the screen here display a gracile australopithecine on the left-hand side, that's an afarensis skull, and on the right-hand side we've got a robust australopithecine, that's Paranthropus ethiopicus. The consensus at the moment is that we're descended from the gracile variety of australopithecines, but if you looked at the robust australopithecines, you can see why they're called robust. They've got these large facial features, big cheekbones, and there's that fin on the top of its head. That's a sagittal crest, which all Paranthropus species demonstrate. And this is a muscle attachment, which anchors large muscles so that they can chew hard foods, which the gracile varieties of Australopithecines, they lack that and they have much softer, less defined features. The first Australopithecine remains to be described were that of Australopithecus africanus. These were first described in 1925 by Raymond Dart, who saw this species as the missing link between ape and man. However, this idea came under flack. English anthropologists at the time were really taken with the Piltdown hoax, and so the presuppositions about how human ancestry evolved, Africanus didn't fit into this because the Piltdown hoax had really skewed the beliefs about human evolution and where humans may have evolved from. There was quite a lot of reasoning at the time that humans actually originated in Asia or Europe. Thankfully, when the hoax was revealed in 1953, and under the sheer weight of the fossils that were beginning to appear in South Africa, the English anthropologists and some of the detractors in wider Europe as well began to take Australopithecines more seriously, and science has thankfully taken that turn ever since, and Australopithecines were finally solidly part of our ancestral tree. Australopithecines may have evolved from a species like Artipithecus ramidus. You can see the fossil remains of Ardi on the screen here, who's dated to about 4.4 million years ago in Ethiopia. They are long grasping fingers and toes, so they would have been tree climbers, but they also had skeletal architecture that would have allowed for bipedal movement. The name Australopithecus is a catch-all phrase, and it's a bit of a misnomer now, seeing as we know Australopithecines have been found all over Africa. So if we break down Australopithecus, Australo meaning southern, Pithecus meaning ape, southern ape, it doesn't really work in context with Australopithecus anamensis, who was found only in eastern Africa, anam meaning lake, by the way, southern ape lake, but Archaeology has often been split into lumpers and splitters, and in the case of Australopithecines, the lumpers have won out, whereas in more modern discoveries today, we mostly tend to split new fossils into different species rather than lumping them in. That seems to be the current trend of things. It may change again in future, but splitting is the preferred technique these days. But Archaeologists don't really like to change things very often, so the name Australopithecine has stuck. So where do you find Australopithecus anamensis? So far there are three main sites in Ethiopia and Kenya, and that's at Waranso Mill, Kanapoi, and Alia Bay, all of which are found in the East African Rift Valley, which you can see on this nice figure which I've lifted from Musiba et al. in their 2023 paper. How Australopithecus anamensis became recognised as an individual species is quite protracted. 
The original fossil to be discovered is the attractively named KNM KP271 distal humerus, and that's this fragment of the humerus on the screen, which was discovered in 1965 and reported on in 1967 by Brian Pattinson, who found this fragment of humerus in western Lake Turkana, which is in Kenya. At the time, they knew it was from an Australopithecus, as numerous other Australopithecus remains had been found, but they didn't know from which one, so there was no way to attribute this bone to a particular species, as it's just a tiny fragment. It doesn't really tell you very much about a species as a whole. So it would be a while yet until Anamensis was actually recognised. Poor old Anamensis wouldn't be assigned a name until 1995, where Maeve Leakey and her team made several successive discoveries of Anamensis fossils at Alia Bay in Lake Turkana, Kenya. They were able to distinguish this as a separate species from Afarensis by looking at various distinctions between the teeth and the jaw. Anamensis and Afarensis look very similar, but because of these differences, they were able to assign that this was a separate species. In the modern day, we've got quite a few Anamensis fossils, most of which now come from Kanapoi, which is also in Kenya, not too far from the Alia Bay site, but a different site on the whole. And at the Kanapoi site, over 60% of all Anamensis fossils come from here, where over 70 different individuals have been recovered. The reconstructions of Anamensis has largely had to be put together from the fragments that have been found across the three main sites. No whole Anamensis skeletons have yet been found. It all comes from different fragments from different fossil finds, mostly relating to the limb bones, but we also have plenty of remains of teeth and jaw as well. What these remains have shown is that Anamensis is quite thickly boned. It's not an especially large hominin, and it may have stood around just below five feet in height and would have been around 50, 51 kilos, maybe dependent on its sex. In 2019, an Ethiopian herder was walking across an area known as Myrodora. At some point during his walk, he looked down and he spotted eroding out of the volcanic tuff this tiny skull. It's the most complete cranium of an anamensis that's ever been found, and there's nothing else quite to compare it with. Archaeologists have tentatively called this an adult male, although, as I said, there isn't much material to cross-reference it with, so we're not entirely sure. But we are fairly sure that this is a mature adult, and this comes from the quite substantial wear that's on its teeth. It's got a cranial capacity of about 370 cubic centimetres, which puts it in a smaller bracket in comparison to the later afarensis, which has a slightly bigger brain size. What is significant most of all is its dating, and I'll get into this later on in the video, but it provided quite a young date of 4.2 to 3.8 million years ago. Out of interest, this is the image that was reconstructed from the MRD skull, and it's great to finally see Anamensis reconstructed accurately. The true significance of the MRD skull comes from its dating. Like I said before, it dates to between 4.2 and 3.8 million years ago. And this presented somewhat of an issue for paleoanthropologists because Afarensis, which came after Anamensis, was meant to have evolved from Anamensis by about 3.9 million years ago, whereas the dating of the MRD skull suggests there was actually an overlap between the two species by about 100,000 years. So Anamensis cannot have evolved simply into Afarensis via the process of agenesis. What has been suggested is that maybe a group of Anamensis split off and evolved from the main population in a process called cladogenesis and that small group of anamensis evolved into afarensis and the remainder of the anamensis population continued living on until they were extinct but there was still somewhat of an overlap between the two species. The jury is still out on this and I, I strongly suspect there will be a lot of arguments and discussion in future as more discoveries are made.
The ever-increasing sample size of the fossils of Anamensis means that we have a better idea of what it had looked like. And it seems that Anamensis had mosaic features, which means it had a mixture of primitive or older features and more modern features. Anamensis is on the whole less ape-like and less primitive than its possible descendant Ardipithecus ramidus. However, it still has some primitive traits such as curved phalanges, which would have been really good for helping it climb trees. It also has long arms in comparison to its body size. It does, however, have a plethora of more modern traits. It has ankle joint morphology in its lower ankle that would have allowed it to be bipedal. It also lacks particular shoulder musculature that you see in arboreal monkeys, so it was most likely spending the majority of its time on the ground. It also has a fairly centered head on its spinal column, whereas chimps, for example, their heads jut forward on their spines. Also, the canine size of Anamensis is much smaller in comparison to chimps, and that is overall a more modern feature. The sizes of canines is quite important in establishing sexual dimorphism among species. So on the screen here, I've got a side-by-side -side comparison of an Anamensis mandible against a modern chimpanzee mandible. And you can see in the chimpanzee, they've got these really large canines, whereas the Anamensis canines, they're not as large or as sharp. There is enough variation, however, amongst Anamensis fossils to make the suggestion that there was still sexual dimorphism amongst male and female individuals. Canines on a whole, however, amongst hominins have actually been reducing for about six million years. And it seems that Anamensis is on that trend of general canine reduction. The teeth of Anamensis is largely where the discussion of the whole species comes from. Teeth survive really well in the archeological record in comparison to bone. So that's where a lot of the academic research has gone into. Peter Ungar, for example, and his team in 2010 looked at micro scratches on Anamensis teeth to try and establish what sort of diet Anamensis may have had. And you can see an example of micro scratches on the screen here. And they decided that Anamensis wasn't eating very much hard food at all. They may have had a diet more similar to contemporary monkey species who eat grass and foliage. However, Esther Barons et al. in 2012 had a little bit of a contrasting view, and they thought that Anamensis was eating more hard foods, or at least seasonally, and they may have been eating things such as underground storage organs and nuts. But this may have only been a fallback food. Maybe hard foods wasn't a preferable food to Anamensis, and they actually would have preferred softer foods. And if you look at other papers which have gone into isotope analysis, we might see that the preference for softer foods comes out a bit better, and I'll explain that in the next slide. If you ever look at an isotope paper, you'll likely come across a graph like this one, which I lifted from Sponheimer et al's 2013 paper. And in the case here, we're looking at carbon isotopes, carbon-13 in particular. Levels of carbon-13 can help deduce what type of plants a species is eating. And in this case of Anamensis, they mostly show low levels of carbon-13, and this would correlate with C3 plants. C3 plants tend to be things like leaves and fruit, and therefore that indicates a soft food diet. And this is correlated amongst several isotope papers. Curlin et al's 2013 paper, for example, looked at 12 different Anamensis species, and they all show very high levels of C3 plants. Martin et al's paper in 2020 looked at five different Anamensis specimens, and they also show very high levels of C3 plants. So overall, I think we can deduce that the isotopes are showing the preferential diet of Anamensis, which is a soft food diet dominated by fruits, maybe leaves as well. And then the 
scratches, the micro scratches are showing the fallback diet of Anamensis, which are the hard nuts, the hard underground storage organs as well. But the preferential diet for Anamensis is likely in soft foods. I would just like to finish by briefly going through the environment of Anamensis. The Canapoi site, for example, has been studied fairly substantially, and the suggestion for that site is that Canapoi is a lake delta and that it was surrounded by woodland, which perhaps this is where Anamensis inhabited. But the species that Anamensis would have to have contended with were things like this giant warthogs called Notocoarius eulius. Canapoi was home to numerous megafauna species, and that also included this rather strange looking elephant species called Dinotherium bozazi. The megafauna and Anamensis were unlikely to have interacted much. However, Canapoi was not a safe place for Anamensis. Poor old Anamensis had to contend with two varieties of saber toothed cats, which are called Dinophelis and Homotherium. Not only did Anamensis have to flee from large cats, but Canapoi was also home to one species of the genus Parahyena. There's only one species of Parahyena left today which we can compare the extinct species to, and that's the brown hyena, which you can see on the screen here. But they would undoubtedly have liked to have snacked upon poor old Anamensis. Anamensis was also not safe when going to take a drink down at the lake delta, as the water was also home to three different crocodile species, which would have been a threat every single time poor old Anamensis went to go and take a drink. I'll now conclude the broad points that we've gone over. So Anamensis is indeed a very complex topic, and even with new discoveries like the MRD skull, these may inform us in one area, but they also show that we really don't have a clue in others. The previously thought direct ancestral relationship between Anamensis and Afarensis, that's no longer so clear cut, and I imagine a lot of researchers are gonna be putting some efforts into establishing what that relationship was. Anamensis is still the oldest Australopithecine we have. It's just that that dating has been pushed forward in time. So it's a, a lot younger than we thought, maybe by about 100,000 years. Anamensis displays mosaic features. It's got primitive features such as long fingers, small brain, long arms, but it does display more modern features such as smaller canines, bipedalism, etc. My motto is, as is the case with any of these deep prehistory cases, this is all going to be wrong next week. So I, I can 100% guarantee we'll be looking at Anamensis again in the future and probably in a completely different light, but that's just the nature of archeology. span Thank you so much for taking the time to watch my video. I hope that you found it enjoyable and informative. As always, I'll leave the links to the figures that I've used to illustrate the slides and the links to the reports that I've used to research the video in the description below. So you can go through those to your heart's content. This video was quite difficult to make as so many of these papers are behind a paywall. So a lot of them tend to be open access journals or they are the draft reports for what will then go on to be a paywalled report. So I'm grateful to all the academics who did put those draft reports up because that helped me out so much. I'd like to make a second big thank you and a big welcome to all the newcomers who've arrived to this channel. I believe because of my Neolithic Massacres video, which seems to have drawn a lot of attention, I received so much positive and helpful feedback on that video and it was really gratifying to see everyone enjoying archaeology as much as I do. So thank you so much for that. That was really heartwarming. I will see all of you next time on Archaeology 101. Thanks guys.